Hey everybody, Ron Bielefeld, Whistling Wings Photography. Welcome to another video. Hey, out here on an evening swallowtail kite tour with a good client friend of mine, Min. She's sitting right over here. Can't see her. <laughs> she, she just waved. Anyway, uh, intro to my next video. Uh, what, a week ago or so, I had a client come down with the expressed interest in me proving to him that his Canon R7 paired with the 800 millimeter 5.6 RF could actually take quality pictures. He was struggling with that combination and so he came down to shoot swelltail kites with me and have me shoot that combination. So that's what this video is about. The camera setup with the lens and then the results. Was I able to get good images with the R7 with the 800 5.6 RF? Hey, if you're interested in finding out how it turned out, stay tuned. All right, so I'm back in my studio after my swallowtail kite tours. It was a really good kite season this year. I guess you can call it a season, mid-July through mid-August. One of the best I've had in many years. If you're interested in doing a kite tour, hey, just email me. We can do one next year. Anyway, talking about the Canon R7 and the Canon 800 millimeter f5.6 on the r7 performance like i said in the introduction i had a client that came down to shoot the kites with me but he also wanted me to prove to him that you could get good images shooting basically 1280 millimeters you put the 800 on the canon r7 which is a crop 1.6 times crop sensor so you got a built-in 1.6 times teleconverter, basically. And he was struggling to get good images with this combination. So he said, here, you shoot it, and you prove to me that you can get good images with this combination. So I did. I shot it for a whole morning. I've had the R7 since it came out. Don't have the 800 5.6 RF. Really expensive. I've got the 600. I'm not... In the market for the 800 I use teleconverters on my 600 so I don't have the 800 but he let me use his of course and well we can take a look at how I did with that combination but before we do that I want to go into the menus a little bit of the R7 and show you how I had it set up for this shooting scenario and if you've watched any of my other videos about birds in flight with these new mirrorless cameras Canon cameras You'll know that I'm a stickler a bit anyway on the fact that, you know, with these cameras now, there's a lot of settings, a lot of autofocus settings, IS settings, blah, 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 blah. You can tailor them so well now to your shooting scenario. So I did that, of course, in this shoot with the R7 and 800 uh, 5.6. And so I want to show you why how I had it set up and why. I'll go over a little bit of it right now in the sense that with 1280 millimeters I'm going after certain shots I want the birds very big in the frame. Sometimes I'm not even trying most of the time actually I'm not even trying to get the entire bird in the frame. I'm cutting the wings off. These birds are skimming on the water, as you'll see, getting drinks of water before they go off to forage for the rest of the day. And those skimming shots are the shots we're after primarily. Now, I just want the detail. I want the head in the water, getting the water, coming out of the water, all the water dripping out of the bird's beak. A lot of times they get too much. There's overflow there. That's what I'm going. If I'm going to be shooting 1,280 millimeters, those are the kind of shots I'm going for. So, then how do I set up my camera and my lens to help get those images? So that's what we'll talk about in just a second. We'll go into the menus 
and I'll tell you exactly how I set it up and why. Well, I guess, you know what? Let's go into the menus right now and we'll cover that and then we'll come back and we'll have a little more discussion about why if I don't cover it really well while I'm going through the menus. And then at the end, I'm going to show a slideshow. For the most part, I guess you call it a slideshow of the images I was able to capture with this combination. And then you can determine for yourself whether the R7 with the 800 f5.6 can capture good images of birds in flight. And then you can kind of think about it in another way. Well, I'm never going to get the 800 5.6, so who cares? Well, maybe, but you might have the 600. You put a 1.4 on there, you're at 840 millimeters. You put a two times on there, you're at 1200 millimeters. You're getting out there close to 1280. So pretty similar. And I can tell you this right now, that the 600 with the two times on the R7 pretty much performs close to the 800 5.6. I think the 800 5.6 was a little bit better with autofocus speed, IS, things like that. But you're going to find out why maybe the IS thing isn't so important. So anyway, let's dive into the menus. Okay, so here we are in the menus. And I've moved all the way over to the shoot menu, tab seven. The first thing I want to talk about is the, let's move down, shutter mode. And you've got three choices, mechanical, electronic first curtain, and electronic. I shot, in this scenario, electronic. And I shot it on drive mode H. Now, you're saying, but the Canon R7 in electronic shutter has rolling shutter issues. Yes, kind of, but there's some problems if you choose mechanical and of course you're going to shoot H plus here in mechanical that gives you about 15 frames per second buffer still lasts long enough here but the problem with shooting mechanical shutter which I think overrides the small problem of and I think it is a small problem of rolling shutter in this scenario you're not going to see rolling shutter problems on the bird you're going to see a little bit maybe in the background elements being slanted a little bit but if you go to mechanical shutter and you go to drive mode H plus what happens is the viewfinder isn't as reactive it's not as smooth it's harder to pan with moving subjects like these swall tail kites if you go to mechanical shutter and you go to H, let's say six and a half frames per second or so, it's even worse. Now there's some settings in there that we'll talk about in another video that can help this, but it's still not as good as if you shoot in electronic shutter and H as far as drive mode goes. You could shoot electronic shutter and go to H+, plus, but then you're shooting 30 frames per second. The buffer fills really, really fast. Too fast. To capture the action I want, I have to meter my shooting too much that way. So instead, we go to H, which is, again, 15 frames per second, which is plenty to capture the action that I want, but also leaves my buffer last longer. So I can get the action, all of the action I generally want without having to meter my shooting too much. So... That is why I shot electronic shutter versus mechanical shutter. And you'll see from the images that they look great. I don't think there's any problem. Maybe you think there's a problem with rolling shutter. I don't think there's a problem with rolling shutter. So moving on, I'm going to go through here. I don't think there's really anything else in here that, you know, here, we'll, we'll talk about it. Display performance. Okay, that you should have set to smooth. Ups the frame rate, refresh rate, sorry, refresh rate of the viewfinder, stuff like that. But that's coming in a new video I'm going to do. This display performance and, and high, high speed display and those two settings and the difference between them and why it's important. But 
Anyway, in here, I don't think there's too much more we need to deal with. So go on to autofocus. There's some obvious stuff in here. You want to be in servo, auto mode, auto, autofocus operation. You want to be in one shot, which is the option here, right? One shot or servo. We want to be in servo. The autofocus area though, okay? What do you want? What, what do we want to do here? Do we want, do we want to use a zone? Do we want to use uh, eye detection, tracking? Well, generally when I shoot swallowtail kites in this scenario, you can see some pictures. I'll put a couple pictures up right now. You can see the scenario we're shooting in. Bird coming down, reflections on the water, ripples on the water and stuff like that. I generally would stay away from eye detection, disabled, right now, but we'll talk about where it was when I was shooting. I would use a zone, like the flexible zone. Decent size, about the size of the bird that I want, so it takes away the <clears throat> background elements and helps the autofocus focus on the bird. But because this bird was so close, these birds were so close, we're using very high focal length here, and I'm trying to get these really close skimming birds, just their head, water dripping out, like I said earlier, I took a different route here. And this is what I talk about customization, that you can do this. You can leave autofocus area on the zone, but you come down here and you put eye detection on and you put tracking to on. So now you're gonna start out with that zone. It's gonna grab the bird hopefully right away and then it's gonna to switch to tracking and it's gonna look for the eye. And because the bird is so close and so big in the frame, the eye's big in the frame, and so the autofocus did really, really well on this setting in this scenario by using eye detection with tracking, starting out with a relatively small zone. The other reason to use eye detection here, you can use zone, and zone was working pretty good, but I switched pretty quickly because as close as the bird is, as high as the focal length is, our depth of field is very, very shallow. I needed to get the eye as the focal point the plane of focus needed to be on the eye as much as possible because depth of field wasn't going to cut it, wasn't going to be deep enough if the camera decided to focus on a wingtip or further out on the bird or on the feet or something like that. So here, in this scenario, with high focal lengths, very shallow depth of field, I chose eye detection, but the bird's big in the frame. Bird's big in the frame, eye's big in the frame, Autofocus did a very good job of finding the eye 80, 90% of the time. So that's what I did. Eye detection enabled, subject to detect, eye detection enabled, subject to detect animals, subject tracking on, autofocus area zone. And then, like I said, servo autofocus. So really those are the main, main settings that I customized for this shooting scenario the case, auto. Pretty much have all of my Canon cameras on auto now. It's, they work really well that way. I've left them there. I've gone back to my case two setup. You can see where it is here, tracking sensitivity all the way negative, Excel D-cell tracking all the way to the positive, giving you a very stable autofocus type performance. But I've not noticed any difference moving back and forth. Whoops, that was not good. Uh, so I'm on auto now. Pretty much in staying there. All this other stuff we're not going to talk about because we don't need to. Boom, 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 boom. Let's look at something else real quick and we'll talk about shutter speed and things. We'll get out of the menus now because we don't really have to be there but we'll look at some images and we'll talk about um, my shutter speed setup and why. All right. So after a quick jump into the menus, we're back out again. It's a little boring looking at those menus. Probably gets a little boring looking at me. I don't know. But let's talk about my settings for shooting these birds in flight, these swallowtail kites coming down the skim, flying around, soaring, whatever. 280 millimeters, 280, <laughs> 1280 millimeters, right? Is that right? Right? You got eight times six times eight is 48. 
Yeah, 1,280 millimeters. High math. We're doing high math here today. Sorry for you non-mathematicians, but we're doing high math. So anyway, um, fast shutter speeds. And you can see in the images here, I'll put the, a few of them, they're all about the same between one four thousand, one five thousandth of a second. Heck, sometimes I was up at one eight thousandth of a second. Because again, very fast birds in the sense of they're very close, you're at high focal lengths, though the overall speed of the bird to the sensor, to the autofocus system, is, is, is fast. And so it's difficult to pan exactly at the right speed. So you want that shutter speed there as a buffer, as a fudge factor, for you not being able to pan at a perfect speed with the bird. So high shutter speeds when you're shooting such high focal lengths, flying birds, you're going to get a lot more sharp images that way. If you're really, really good at panning, heck, I've shot flying birds at 1 100th of a second. You're, you're going to get some sharp shots, especially at 30 frames per second, 20 frames per second, 15 frames per second. All these high frame rates we're shooting now, you're going to get a few good ones in there. And if you have to do that, great. But the light is good out there. We've got white on these birds, a lot of white. You can shoot high shutter speeds. And if you can shoot high shutter speeds, go ahead and do it. There's nothing wrong with shooting one eight thousandth of a second. There really isn't. You're going to get more sharp shots that way. Next, aperture. Eh, you know, five six, wide open. You can do that. It's one of the benefits of having the 800 5.6 on the R7 is you don't have to put a teleconverter on there and lose speed on your system, on your lens. So sometimes 5.6, sometimes 6.3, sometimes 7.1. But in that range, you're not, it's nice to gain when you're, when you're using so much focal length and you got the bird so close. It's nice to be able to gain even a little bit of depth of field, help that eye, get that eye sharp. So I, I moved it up when I could. And then ISO, what, what's left, right? ISO, about 800 ISO most of the time. Sometimes 1,000, sometimes down six, what is it? 640 is the next step down, 630, 640. I don't remember these things all the time. But anyway, in that range, and in that range, the R7, the noise is good. It's good. We're not having to crop a lot here either because of course, the birds are close. A little clop, a little clop. Oh my gosh. It is early in the morning, let me tell you this. I got up really early. I'm, I'm smoking a brisket outside. So I had to get up really early because it's like a long cook. But anyway, yeah. So, ISO, the noise is not, is not bad. Not a lot of cropping there. Crop for composition. I, I said it right that time crop for composition. That's about it. So not a lot of cropping, so the noise wasn't an issue. So those were my general, that's my general setup. ISO 800, f5.6, 6.3, 1 4,000, 1 5,000, 1 8,000th of a second, something like that. And as you've seen a few images already, you'll see some more if you want to watch them at the end of the video. It worked out really well. It was a, it's a great combination. I was really impressed with it. Am I going to get the 805.6? Nope. Like I said earlier, I've got the 600. It's flexible for me and what I do most of the time. So I'm going to stick with that. But if you have the wherewithal to get the 805.6 and you've got the R7 to get you that really long focal length with a prime lens of that quality, you're going to get some good images. You're, you are. Let me talk about one more thing, IS setting, okay? You think, okay, well, IS could be important too because of all these factors I've been talking about, the speed of the bird, the closeness, panning, you want things stable. True, I have my IS turned off. Why? Because when you're shooting at those highest shutter speeds, the IS isn't going to help you so much anyway. It will help stabilize the viewfinder if you need that. But again, I didn't really need that. The other reason why I turned it off is because the way these birds fly, they come down, they hit the water, and they woo, they go up really fast. And when they're close to you and you're using all that focal length, they go, when they go, I mean, it's like, you know, you're, yeah. Your 
field of view is really small. So what you're having to do, if you set it to IS mode two for panning, right, for birds in flight is generally a pretty good setting. And then, but you have to go like this really fast because again, to keep up with that bird as it pulls up off the water, here's a picture of the bird, a bird doing that. Um, the IS, IBIS, doesn't like that so much and tries to come back down and tries to stabilize that movement because you were panning like this and all of a sudden you go, you go up real fast. It wants to kind of, it doesn't know that you've changed your panning direction and it'll drag you back down and you don't get the bird when it pulls up off the water. So that's why I turn it off in this scenario. And you see that I'm saying throughout this video, scenario, scenario, scenario. Yes, scenarios change, as you know. You're not always shooting the same thing in the same way. So change what you do. I change what I do. I turned IS off here. Usually I'm in, I have my IS turned on, my IS IBIS, my stabilization, whatever you want to call it, turned on. Here I turned it off for the reasons I said. So high shutter speeds, and because the birds were pulling up, or coming down really fast, diving down, right? Pan, 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 woo, come down. Well, the auto, the IBIS goes uh, like that because I'm trying to stabilize it. It'll, it'll switch pretty quickly, but not that fast. So you lose some shots. So there you go. There is my setup for this scenario. And you can see by the images you've seen so far and you can see some more. I think the system did really, really well. Anything else? I don't know. I don't think there's anything else here. If you have any questions, you can put them down there. You know, you can leave a co comments are great. I love getting comments. Put them down there. I'll answer them. Try to anyway. Uh, description. I'll have some stuff in there. I don't know what I'll have in there this time. I usually have some stuff in there. You can take a look at the description. I don't know how many people actually look at the description of the video because there's stuff in there sometimes and then I get questions about something and it was right in there in the description. So look at the description. There might be some cool stuff in there. Of course, if you like my channel, subscribe, please. Please subscribe. I have a very sensitive ego. And if I don't get subscriptions, I don't know, I might not be motivated to do any more videos. And some of you might love that, that I don't do any more videos. Anyhow, that's it. Hey. Until next time, I hope you have great light. Be safe out there. Get great images. I'll see you soon.